Hi, thanks very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, the history of the Pavilion Women's Photography Centre. Um, I work for Pavilion, um, it, it continues to exist to this day. Um, but in 1994, um, it stopped being defined as a women's photography centre. Um, so it's the founding moment that I'm talking about today. <clears throat> the Pavilion Women's Photography Centre opened in Leeds in 1983 as the first feminist photography centre in the UK. It was set up by three graduates, Dinah Clark, Shirley Moreno and Caroline Taylor, who had come through Leeds University's School of Fine Art where they had encountered the teaching on the social history of art, most notably through the presence of feminist art historian Griselda Pollock. The pavilion was established in a renovated park pavilion on Woodhouse Moor as a space for the exhibition and production of photography, but also functioned as a space for debate about representation. And the kind of artist it was showing was um, Jo Spence, Rosie Martin, Maggie Murray, um, Ingrid Pollard and Maud Sultan, it was great to see in Christine's presentation a little pavilion poster um, of the testimony exhibition um, at one point. Um, to get the building and programme up and running, the pavilion was awarded £8,000 of funding from the Yorkshire Arts Association and £20,000 from other sources. Early in 1984, less than a year after it opened, Yorkshire Arts Association withdrew its programme funding. In an internal memo within the archive of the Yorkshire Arts Association, shortly after the pavilion had had its funding withdrawn, one can read about a visit made by visual arts officer Simon Rudhouse and photography historian John Tagg to the Pavilion Women's Photography Centre in Leeds. The visit was made, it says, sometime between the 11th and 13th of April 1984. The account reads as follows. A rather dispiriting visit. Yorkshire Arts Association had withdrawn programme support because of a number of issues... Shortage of funds, ineffective management, lack of local authority support, and growing exclusiveness of events, women only. Both the gallery and darkroom are now functioning and run by voluntary effort, but both seem to lack direction and energy. We encourage the staff to respond vigorously to Yorkshire Arts Association's withdrawal of support, particularly in view of the significance of leads in the Arts Council strategy. So as I read this in the present with some understanding of the transformations feminism has, effective, has, has affected, I read ineffective management as asserting the way in which Yorkshire Arts Association understood the pavilion's political commitment to a collective, non-hierarchical method of organisation. I read exclusiveness of events as the Yorkshire Arts Association's coding of the attention being paid by the pavilion to the marginalisation of women within the visual arts field and within wider society. Thus, in this simple record, it is possible to read the failure of a key stakeholder to recognise or acknowledge the significance of the pavilion at its moment of foundation. Writing in response to the withdrawal of funding, which was justified in part on the grounds of aesthetic quality, pavilion founder Shirley Moreno wrote that aesthetic quality is a standard distilled from contemporary mainstream art. Any critical practice must contradict its aesthetic as well as its meaning in order to evolve new aesthetics meanings. From the outset, therefore, there's a collision between the initiating politics of the pavilion and the arts organisations who funded it. Moreno's positioning of the pavilion as existing in opposition to the contemporary mainstream must be placed within the context of feminist discourse. In 1980, the US publication Art Journal published a text by curator and critic Lucy Lippard titled Sweeping Exchanges, the Contribution of Feminism to the Art of the 1970s. In this text, in which Lippard defines feminism as being necessarily oppositional to the modernist framework, she writes, Feminism's greatest contribution to the future of art has probably been precisely its lack of contribution to modernism. Feminist methods and theories have instead offered a socially concerned alternative to the increasingly mechanical evolution of art about art. Moreno's debt to Lippard can also be tracked in a text that was published in Artist Newsletter in 1981. Um, that formed the basis of the pavilion's application for its Arts Council funding. In this text, Moreno writes, Feminist art is more than another ism that claims equal representation. It forms the major critique of modernism. This view has been further complicated by Griselda Pollock in Framing Feminism, who urges a consideration of modernism through feminism that does not simply assimilate feminism with postmodernism in its emphasis upon pluralism and a break with the aesthetic autonomy of modernism. Postmodernism, Pollock argues, still sits within the dominant order, and thus the introduction of multicolored threads of female experience into the male fabric of modern art 
as Lippard later puts it, does not necessarily ask the deeper questions required about the social and historical reasons for the predominance of men practicing and being celebrated in modernism. <coughs> Um, through exhibitions of historic photography and support for contemporary photographers, the funding institutions of the 1970s and 80s, I argue, celebrated and supported the individual expression, creative or concerned vision of the masculine artist genius, and had not hitherto addressed the social and economic conventions that rendered the production and exhibition of art inaccessible for most women. <coughs> So, um, against the context of the dominant photographic culture, though, what the previously referenced memo um, is written to evidence is, of course, that the pavilion was an organisation which was defunct, defunct virtually before it began. We read of the withdrawal of funding, ineffective management, lack of local authority support, lack of direction and energy. In her same um, 1985 account of the pavilion's aims, Shirley Moreno wrote that the pavilion was seen by the left as elitist, the art world saw us as propagandist, and the right simply withdrew funding. The writing and reading of institutional histories is fraught with challenges for all researchers, but when exclusion, marginalisation and misunderstanding is so present within a history, the challenge of interpreting the significance of this history becomes even more profound. This challenge is the starting point for my project. This is the opening exhibition of the pavilion. On 22nd November 2014, a new film to the editor of Amateur Photographer was launched at the High Pop Picture House in Leeds. It was commissioned by the Current Day Pavilion, which I have directed for the last three years, to mark the occasion of the organisation's 30th anniversary and to look back on its founding moment when the pavilion was set up as a women's photography centre. The 70-minute film was made by visual artist Luke Fowler in collaboration with music producer Mark Fell. And it was seen by the organisation as an experiment into what would result if two contemporary artists, both men who had encountered something of feminism's history through art school, were to confront the archive of a feminist project. The fact that the commissioned artists are of a different sex and generation from those involved in the pavilion's founding and are active in the professional market-driven contemporary art field made unsurprisingly for a contested process from the outset – foregrounding the challenge of making sense of and representing a history from the distance of the present. <clears throat> to the editor of Amateur Photographer is a 70-minute presentation of photographs and documents found within the Pavilion Archive. A large part of the film is a rolling sequence of 1,235mm photographic negatives from the Pavilion Archive that, in preparation for the film, were scanned, printed on 10 by 8 paper, re-photographed on a 16mm rostrum camera at the Leeds Animation Workshop and presented in the film in the order they were found, roll by roll. The photographs were not edited by the artists and include several that are out of focus, repeats, the wrong orientation, damaged or the end of rolls. Documentation of events, meetings, social situations and educational workshops. The photographs are a somewhat eclectic and perplexing stream of images that appear and disappear rapidly throughout the film. The work supports Jessica Evans's claim that there is no justification from a feminist point of view for continuing to study only the significant, the better, the more aesthetically satisfying or sophisticated objects. However, the kind of problem with this was that the, film, um, the filmmakers did not have access to very much of the actual photography or exhibition material included at the pavilion, <coughs> much of which has been lost or at best um, dispersed and um, and arguably decontextualized in public or private collections. Um, and so to kind of place this emphasis on these kind of images um, sort of gave quite a sort of um, confusing reading of um, the organization. I don't have time to go too much into a reading of the film, um, but suffice it to say that what the film raises is the problem of the archive for feminist grassroots projects. Um, Luke Fowler's ongoing interest as a filmmaker is to contend and complicate dominant views of socialist histories, and his inclusion of images that would be traditionally left out of a standard documentary as part of that process. Um, but unlike other subjects from the radical left that Fowler has dealt with, there is not a collective knowledge of the pavilion from which to begin. One subject, for example, um, of Fowler's other films is the experimental musician Cornelius Cardew, who has been widely attended to both for his influence as an experimental avant-garde composer and for his political activism as a committed Marxist. And um, thus Fowler's kind of um, somewhat layered and distorting portrait of Cardew's archive 
make sense as an attempt to negotiate and reconcile his political and artistic identities and to complicate the kind of leftist idolising of this male modernist history. So my point is that while a certain amount of support was provided to um, the pavilion at its moment of inception, this did not correlate with a knowledge or appreciation of its founding aims. The pavilion was never widely understood as contributing to new aesthetic innovations um, or kind of progressing um, the avant-garde. Um, and, and I think this is evidenced in what knowledge exists of the organisation today, or there's a kind of legacy of that sort of underappreciation. Um, much of the actual work that was exhibited in the pavilion has been lost or is now in public collections. Some of it um, has also been stolen. With the exception of two chapters in books, both published more than 15 years ago, there is no published material on the pavilion to refer to. Its archive exists as a collection of uncatalogued papers within the Feminist Archive North, which is housed within but at the margins of the special collections at Leeds University. It's run by a group of under-resourced, very hard-working women volunteers, rather than the paid library staff that the university employs. As I've sought to show, the feminism that underpinned the pavilion was not legible to the Yorkshire Arts Association in its foundational year years, and instead it perceived its feminist strategies, aesthetics, and organisational methods as those of a failed or naive project. And I argue that we need to look beyond the kind of um, official archive to challenge that reading today. In a recent interview for Moose magazine, Karen Goldberg asked Luke Fowler, did this subject demand a different form of observation? And I argue that um, this is exactly what the subject of a grassroots feminist art project demands. In Art and Feminism, Themes and Movements, Peggy Fallon argues that writing about art has traditionally been concerned with that which is interior to the frame, whereas feminism has focused primarily on what lies outside the frame of patriarchal logic, representation, history and justice, which is to say the lives of most women. If we recognise the archive as following a patriarchal logic in its focus on inclusion and exclusion, classification and objectification, then it follows that we must look outside of that frame to those um, less observable, quantifiable resources of knowledge. As a way of meeting the challenge and limitations of the archive, the artists of the commissioned film um, also selected to interview 12 people um, who were involved in Pavilion's founding. Um, and within the film, I think these excerpts of interviews go some way to countering the somewhat chaotic and uncontextualised flow of images and artefacts. Um, and I'm trying to use these interviews um, in my own research as a kind of productive resource um, that stands outside of the official archive. Um, in pursuing my argument that the pavilion should be understood as an incomplete project rather than a defunct one, one of my tasks over the last year has been to locate a method of reading the memories of pavilion's participants produced through the commissioned film as the material that brings something additional to the archival artefacts. Unlike in ethnography, this study is not about observing behaviours, but neither is it about analysing formal text um, through, for example, critical discourse analysis or other such methodology. I also wish to avoid analysing material through grand, uh, grand narrative, um, such as Marxism or psychoanalysis, although I do recognise that these paradigms provide useful routes for me to understand how feminists have begun to articulate and understand their struggle. I wish to remain open to the unexpected and thus to avoid framing these memories through a particular theoretical lens, particularly those theorisations that have been brought about and canonised on the basis of celebrated grand masters. The grounded theory method, um, I'm not sure if this is familiar to anybody, is a qualitative method ordinarily used within the field of social science that at Leeds University at least is being um, increasingly used in the study of art institutions and practices and particularly in producing new knowledge about the investments and lived experiences individuals have in relation to those institutions. It's distinct from an ethnographic approach in that it rejects a straightforward relationship between knowledge and observation. It's to, instead, it invokes a third tool of coding as a means of interpretation that enables a production of knowledge that cannot be arrived at simply through describing the behaviours or testimonies of the subjects being observed. Secondly, and importantly for a feminist study, it actively seeks to put aside a hypothesis or preconceived theory, allowing instead for the theory to be informed by the data. The emphasis of grounded theory is on creating a body of material through conversations and interviews that are coded using 
gerunds um, according to the terms of experience that subjects describe in relation to particular <coughs> lived practices. The process of coding enables a researcher to take from the descriptions of experiences a set of concepts that lead on to a theoretical hypothesis of what people's kind of priorities um, were around um, a particular experience. Um, and this is a method that I've, cho I've chosen to use when reading these memories. <clears throat> a set of 12 interviews um, were conducted in the course of making to the editor of Amateur Photographer, um, and I've used 10 of these as qualitative data for my grounded theory work. My work began with a process of initial coding, and this is a kind of process of grounded theory, in which I took each interview in turn, um, taking a simple code from each line of the interviews. For example, in her extended interview, curator Angela Kingsden talks about the experience of being heavied by the police during her time at the pavilion. She says, but I had letters opened. It was like letters would be delivered to me and they'd been opened and no attempt, you know, they hadn't sort of steamed them open. They were letting us know that we were under observation. From this sentence, I created the code under surveillance. Um, the second stage of coding within... Oh, this is just a spreadsheet here. <laughs> um, within um, the grounded theory method is referred to as axial coding. Um, and during this stage, the researcher aims to find links between different categories, enabling codes to be grouped into um, less specific codes. And I produced 60 of these in total. Um, for example, under surveillance was grouped together with several other codes um, to make the code sense of outside world feeling threatened. And a kind of further process of condensing and collating of themes then takes place um, to produce a set of selective codes, which came to 16 in total. Um, doing this in an Excel spreadsheet um, was sort of interesting because it enabled me to see which codes were being populated the most. And I guess just sort of for my, for just for this it sounds a bit kind of random, but just for the use of the presentation, what was most interesting was to discover that the sense of this being a project marked by loss or failure only really represented a very small aspect of people's memories, whereas it's obviously kind of was right there at the beginning of um, external perceptions of the organisation. There were two selective codes that emerged as being by far the most populated. Um, the first was destabilising representation, which is a kind of condensation of um, codes that related to challenging the standard forms of representation and dominant uses of photography. The second was the women's movement, which incorporated codes that related to the ideas, motivations, and modes of organisation that underpin the women's movement. And so um, I've kind of brought these together to make a kind of final concept, um, which I've called feministing photography. And it's this concept, what it meant for feminists to take up photography as a means of investigating the social world and women's experiences within it that I'm um, interested in. I mean, of course, it's no surprise that, that this is what was kind of present in people's memories and experiences. We all know that the politics of representation is of significance um, when we're talking about women and photography. Um, but by locating the urgent concerns of the pavilion as they persisted across the memories of the organisation's participants, I feel that I'm able to confidently assert that this is a moment and a project that is worthy of research and should not be confined to what Claire Hemmings, writing in relation to the standard narratives of feminism, would describe as either a loss, as a kind of loss narrative, this um, idea that... Um, or kind of she talks about loss and progress narratives in, in terms of feminism... Um, the pavilion should not be understood simply in terms of being failed or defunct project, but one that intervened in the dominant practices, ideas and institutions through its work on the politics of representation. Writing in 10 8 magazine in 1987, artist and photographer Mary Yates argued that feminism produced work that had hardly been seen before in art school, work which operated at the level of art, politics and theory, challenging representation, delighting those involved in it and perplexing the art school. Three Perspectives on Photography, held at the Hayward Gallery in 1979, was um, perhaps the first high-profile mark of this shift in art, politics and theory, um, brought about in part through photography's intersection with feminism. Curated by Paul Hill, Angela Kelly and John Tagg, it presented work by artists such as Joe Spencer, Hackney Flashes, Eve Lomax, Alexis Hunter and others, um, but it also, importantly, um, unsettled the catalogue format of exhibitions. John Tagg has argued that three perspectives was not a way of packaging photography and making it acceptable to the museum, 
but rather that it sought to present the maximum heterogeneity of the field of social engagement and photography. What the exhibition revealed was that feminism's convergence with photography was not simply about women taking photographs, but that feminism destabilised the whole notion of how photographs were taken, to whom they were shown, where they were shown, in what form and to what ends. This challenge to standard assumptions of photography was marked by one critic's response to the Hackney Flashes, which is part of the exhibition, and their work, Who's Holding the Baby, which he said should be longed in, not in a museum but in a women's community hall. So what three perspectives revealed was that while photography was gaining more status within the institution and becoming an accepted fine art form, and you know, we've seen, we saw this um, throughout the 1970s, feminists were simultaneously destabilising photography and the discourse around it. And it was this project that was taken up by the pavilion. So at the same time as the Yorkshire Arts Association, for example, was developing a dedicated policy for, for photography in the region, that recognised photography as a fine art form and that sought to affirm this through special photography awards and funding for new photographic spaces like the pavilion. Its own categories were being challenged by a politicised form of photography that referred to be confined to traditional ideas of self-expression, <coughs> intuition, composition, individual genius, etc. <laughs> but also, as Jane Walk argued, refused to fully embrace conceptualism with its prohibition of subject-centred inquiry. In her book, Art, Labour, Sex, Politics, Feminist Effects in 1970s British Art and Performance, Shona Wilson argues that it, it seems to be a peculiar anachronism that as feminist art becomes part of the dominant, to use Raymond Williams' term, the underlying assumption seems to be that feminism equals women. In seeking to understand the implications of this quote, we can return to another quote by Shirley Moreno, written some 30 years earlier, that if feminism can be mobilised and turned into language, both verbal and visual, and acted on, then a feminist perspective should not be considered marginal. Instead, it would become the critique of society in all its manifestations, not narrow, but all-encompassing. This same argument re-articulated across a 30-year period. The need to recognise feminism's full interventional potential <coughs> underpins my inquiry. 